Hi folks, I could summarize the episodes we're going to watch uh, with these two sentences. The first is when France sneezes, Europe catches a cold. The second one is 1848 was the turning point at which modern history failed to turn. So I'm going to review 1848 episode by Epic History TV. And without further ado, let's go. 1848. More than three decades after his defeat, the shadow of Napoleon Bonaparte and the French Revolution still looms over Europe. The peace settlement of 1815 had been a triumph for reactionary forces. Europe's great powers, Britain, France, Austria, Prussia and Russia, were committed to working together to ensure no more revolutions. Radicalism and republicanism would not be allowed to disturb the peace of Europe again. Austrian Chancellor Prince Clemens von Metternich is regarded as the architect of this new conservative order. Some historians call it the Metternich system. And yet, across Europe, there are many for whom the ideals of the French Revolution remain not a nightmare, but an inspiration. And why? Because France invaded many countries during the revolutionary and the Napoleonic Wars, especially in Germany and Italy. These conquests spread the revolutionary ideas in the continent. When uh, France overthrew the old regimes, they implemented new legislations and new civil codes in the sister republics or client states. And these new legislations are going to change the way people live. And when you're going to restore the old order, there's going to be frictions. Liberals seek personal freedoms and civil rights, such as equality before the law, protected by constitutions, a free press and regular elections. Nationalists share these aims with a desire in Italy and Germany for national unification, or in the multi-ethnic Austrian Empire for greater recognition, autonomy and respect for language. Poles continue to seek the restoration of an independent Poland, and have launched one bloody uprising against the Russians in 1830. Their cause is supported by Liberals across Europe. In most countries, Liberals and Nationalists face draconian censorship laws, arrest by the secret police, and bans on political parties and meetings. But there are always loopholes. In France, private banquets turn into political rallies. In Italy, it is forbidden to have public political gathering. So in France, we organize what we do best. It's having dinners. Uh, take note that you had to pay in order to join so that you can keep the working classes out. During these banquets, people were making toasts in the honor of the reform, a toast to the universal suffrage, to better conditions for the labor classes. Scientific societies discuss politics, while gymnastic groups do the same in Germany. These liberal movements are dominated by the middle class, with their own local and national agendas, but also many shared values and aims. They are passionate, organized, and waiting for their opportunity. Yeah. Alexis de Tocqueville is a very important figure, at least in France. He extensively studied the American democracy and uh, he studied people, maybe one of the first uh, sociologists. He drafted important conclusions saying that masses are driven towards equality in terms of rights. And the more a society is equalitarian, the less people will accept the reminding equalities.
But it isn't just the middle classes that want change. By 1848, rising populations and food prices had created hunger, poverty and social unrest across Europe. Low wages and hunger drive peasants to cities in increasing numbers, where they become cheap labour to feed the growing pace of industrialisation. They live in slums and work long hours in dreadful conditions, if they can find work. Violent protests by workers and peasants are on the rise. Harvest failures and potato blight make a bad situation worse, with a deadly famine in Ireland and food riots across France. And you, you can see a pattern between the big uh, popular revolutions, uh, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution. Even till this day, the Arab Springs back in 2011, it's when on top of bad representations for the people, people are struggling to fulfill their basic needs uh, and they are hungry. That's the real trigger for these revolutions. In the face of such crises, Europe's governments offer little support or hope of reform. When French Prime Minister François Guizot is challenged that only the richest half percent could vote in France, he merely replies, Enrichissez-vous. Sounds a bit like Marie Antoinette, uh, let them eat cake. Under Louis Philippe, uh, in order to be a voter, you have to pay a tax called the sens. One of the reformers' demand was to lower this tax in order to let more people vote. And Guizot's response is, if you want to vote, then take part in enriching the country and deserve it. The problem is that Guizot will stick to this belief and lose touch with reality, which is very dangerous. Get rich. In the winter of 1847-48, a sharp economic downturn throws thousands more out of work. The case for reform is more urgent than ever, but Europe's governments fail to act. The stage is set for a European revolution. In southern Italy, the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies is ruled by Spanish Bourbon King Ferdinand II. His disastrous agrarian reforms have united Sicilian landowners and peasants against him. His kingdom will witness 1848's first revolution. In Sicily, furious crowds chase Bourbon troops out of Palermo and the island declares independence re-adopting its liberal constitution of 1812. Revolutionary fervour spreads to the mainland. Mass rallies in Naples force King Ferdinand to issue his own constitution. In Piedmont, Sardinia, the threat of revolution persuades King Carlo Alberto to grant a constitution, and there are celebrations in the streets of Turin. Across the border, in Austrian-ruled Lombardy, Venetia, Italian nationalists revolt in Milan and Venice and drive out the Austrian garrisons. But as dramatic as these events are, they're about to be eclipsed by news from Paris. So Italy is a very fertile ground for a revolution because when France invaded these states during the revolutionary slash Napoleonic wars, it destabilized the region and also spread new ideas, like I said. Then um, all these states were more or less under Austrian influence. That create one common conservative enemy in direct opposition with the spread of the new ideas and also the feeling that Italian, Italy has to be united in order to be strong, in order to avoid being conquered again. Since 
Since France's 1830 July Revolution, the country has been ruled by Louis-Philippe, the so-called Citizen King. He's a more moderate figure than his Bourbon predecessor, Charles X, but he opposes further reform, despite the growing economic crisis. When I talk about revolutions, I often talk about uh, public opinion and the new speed at which uh, ideas can spread through uh, the press. And here you have a perfect example. His Prime Minister, François Guizot, is hated. When he bans the banquets that are really opposition rallies, angry crowds march through Paris, chanting, Down with Guizot! Long live reform! Guizot resigns, but it is not enough. Nervous troops fire on the crowds. 52 civilians are killed. Louis-Philippe loses control of the capital, and as the mob advances on the Tuileries Palace, he abdicates and flees to England. A new provisional government is formed, and from the Hôtel de Ville, new Foreign Minister Alphonse de Lamartine announces, the Republic has been proclaimed. France's monarchy has fallen in just three days. Three days is our national record. And it all happened because Guizot tried to forbid people to have a dinner. It is what happened in France when you try to prevent people from gathering, drinking wine and having food. The news is carried across Europe by the new telegraph system. These new ideas spread because of technological innovations such as new medias, the development of the press and the railways that will allow people to travel faster and to gather in some places. The effect is electrifying. Seventy-five-year-old Austrian Chancellor Prince Metternich is among the first to be informed of the revolution in Paris. His police chief assures him there's no chance of such a thing happening in Vienna. But on the 13th of March, around 4,000 students, inspired by the news from Paris, march on the Landhaus, the assembly building, and force their way in. There's a confrontation with troops who open fire and kill four. Vienna's workers side with the students. Much of the crowd's hostility is directed at Metternich. When the State Council suggests he resign, Metternich meekly agrees and heads into exile in England. One of the most extraordinary political careers in Europe's history, spanning 40 years, comes to an end. Emperor Ferdinand suffers from epilepsy and a speech impediment and is a largely passive figure. Is also the result of generation and generation of inbreeding in the Habsburgs. Is not a person who's capable to lead a country. But when his council announces there will be elections for an assembly that will draft a constitution, crowds cheer him in the street. The secret police disappear, censorship is ignored, the people of Vienna celebrate. Nationalists within the Austrian Empire are also inspired by events. In the Hungarian parliament, politician Lajos Kossuth makes a fiery speech denouncing Habsburg absolutism as the pestilential air which dulls our nerves and paralyzes our spirit. His speech is printed and circulated widely, inspiring others across the empire. Hungarians launch their own revolution, with 12 demands that include greater autonomy, a free press and parliamentary reform. Czech liberals in Prague form a national committee and also send their demands to Vienna. There is even a Romanian nationalist uprising in the Ottoman province of Wallachia, forcing the abdication of the local prince. All of this 
is maybe allowed by the weakness of the emperor who brought no strong opposition towards the first movements and then all the other nationalities are going to see that and say, hey, maybe we have an opportunity here. Across the smaller states of Germany, rulers face popular demands for reform. Most quickly grant concessions to avoid losing their thrones. The black, red and gold tricolour, symbol of a united Germany, is prominent among the crowds. Germany's first ever National Assembly meets in Frankfurt, with elected delegates from across Germany. They debate how they will achieve the liberal dream of a unified Germany, and begin drafting its national constitution. In the Prussian capital, Berlin, students and liberals are thrilled by developments, and celebrate Metternich's fall. King Frederick William IV promises reform, but also moves extra troops into the city. Tensions escalate between Berliners and soldiers, and on the 18th of March, protesters erect barricades. The army attacks, leading to vicious fighting in the streets. 800 protesters are killed. The king loses his stomach for the slaughter, and withdraws troops from the city, promising a new constitution. Here we go again. So, Russian Empire was also devastated by the Russian campaign of 1812. And they already had their uh, 1848 revolution before everybody with the Decembrist movement. Um, it was basically a coup staged by the army in order to liberalize the regime. It's back in 1824, I guess and it was brutally repressed by the uh, Tsarist regime. Not all Europe is embracing change. In Russia, Emperor Nicholas firmly opposes any reforms. He'd been badly shaken by the Decembrist revolt on the opening day of his reign. Since then, he has tightened censorship and created a new secret police unit, the Third Department. There is a crackdown on all suspected subversives. Writer Fyodor Dostoevsky is among those arrested and subjected to a mock execution before he is exiled to Siberia. There will be no concessions in Russia. By European standards, Britain is already a liberal constitutional monarchy and the middle classes broadly accept the status quo. But there is a popular movement calling for more democratic reforms. They're known as the Chartists, for the six-point charter they wish to implement. A mass rally is organised for the 10th of April in London. This is a photograph of that meeting. The authorities fear violence and draft in 80,000 extra police. But the event passes off peacefully. Great Britain is indeed an early adopter in terms of uh, having a parliamentary monarchy, but moreover, they are very much an early adopter in terms of the Industrial Revolution. And at this point of history, Great Britain's wealth is well above uh, the other continental powers. In the Netherlands, King William II backs a new constitution and reforms, successfully preempting any revolutionary disturbance. With fortuitous timing, Frederick VII of Denmark had abolished royal absolutism in January, so also avoids revolution. But he faces a German nationalist revolt in Schleswig-Holstein, which leads to war with the German Confederation. Denmark will ultimately prevail in this war, thanks to diplomatic support from the other European powers. In 1848, Polish hopes were high that these revolutions would pave the way for the restoration of an independent Poland. 
Europe's liberals, after all, had frequently expressed enthusiasm for the idea. But in reality, no major power is willing to risk confrontation with Russia for the sake of the Poles. A Polish rising in Posen is put down by the Prussians, while the Austrians deal with risings in Krakow and Galicia. The first euphoric phase of the European revolutions becomes known as the Springtime of the Peoples. With censorship relaxed, there's an explosion in the number of newspapers, among them Cologne's radical new daily, Neue Rheinische Zeitung, edited by Karl Marx. It feels like the dawn of a new era. But these early successes are built on the back of an uneasy alliance, as Marx is quick to highlight. Middle-class liberals want constitutions, more inclusion in politics, and a free press. Workers, who are the revolutionary foot soldiers in many cities, want cheaper food and the right to work. German Basically. radicals sum it up with a neat pun, freedom to read versus freedom to feed. These two classes have conflicting agendas, which will be the cause of this revolution being ultimately bringing very few changes. And in this case, so freedom to read, freedom to feed. Who feeds who? Europe's new assemblies are under pressure from conservatives who think they're going too far and radicals and socialists who think they're not going far enough. Most horrifying of all to Europe's middle class, there hovers the threat of mass direct action, social revolution, the mob. like Platao Plomo. In the wake of the revolution, France's provisional government had set up National Workshops, a public works programme to alleviate unemployment in Paris. But just three months later, a new, more conservative government announces their closure. 100,000 workers are suddenly jobless. The response is immediate, and furious. Over three days in June, Paris radicals take on the middle-class National Guard and regular troops in a bloody battle of the barricades. The Archbishop of Paris attempts to mediate, but is cut down in a crossfire. This remarkable early photograph shows some of the Paris barricades fought over that summer. See, at this time, um, Parisian streets are very narrow and you don't have the Grand Boulevard, these uh, big avenues, which serves as arterial roads in order to keep Paris supplied. Now, here with a couple barricades, you can block the city while people are throwing all sorts of things, including human feces from the roof. Um, and actually a factor that, amongst other, reduced the French army willingness to fight in 1830 was that during the revolution in July, they were starving, they had no water, for the city was crippled with these barricades. By the time it's all over, General Cavagnac's troops have killed at least 1,500 workers and arrest 12,000 more, a third of whom are deported to Algeria. He believes he has saved France from anarchy. The sacred cause of the Republic has triumphed, he declares. The French Revolution has split between left and right, with bloody consequences. It paves the way for the return of a famous name from the past, promising unity and order. So Napoleon is back, though it's his nephew this time. 
It's the first elected French president after he tried to set up and fail two coups under Louis Philippe, before he himself has a successful coup in 1852, and that will lead eventually to another revolution, the Paris Commune, when he's going to lose against Prussia in 1870. That spring, Conservative governments had been caught off guard by the speed of events. Now they begin to fight back. In Prague, Czech students clash with troops. The wife of Austrian commander General Windisch Gretz is killed by a stray bullet. He responds by withdrawing his troops and bombarding the city's old town with artillery. 43 are killed before the students surrender. In Italy, King Carlo Alberto of Piemont Sardinia has declared an Italian war of liberation against Austria and invades Lombardy Venetia. He is supported by the other Italian states and nationalist volunteers, including the Italian Legion, led by professional revolutionary Giuseppe Garibaldi. Yeah, the advantage here is that they all have a common enemy, is the Austrian. Austrian forces in Italy are commanded by 81-year-old Field Marshal Radetzky, a distinguished veteran of the Napoleonic Wars. Vienna orders him to negotiate. Instead, Radetzky wages a masterful campaign, fending off the Piedmontese advance, then launching a decisive counterattack. The Edmontese forces retreat in disarray, and Carlo Alberto negotiates a truce. That summer, Johann Strauss composes the Radetzky March to celebrate the old general's victory. Meanwhile, and Radetzky's march is the highlight of the show during the annual New Year's concerts given by the National Orchestra of Vienna. Well, Austrian relations with Hungary are in crisis. The country is now effectively independent, with its own elected parliament and a prime minister, Lajos Batyani. But not everyone wants to be part of the new Hungary. Savage ethnic conflicts break out between Hungarians and Romanians in Transylvania and Hungarians and Serbs in Vojvodina, leaving thousands dead. An even greater threat is Croatian General Josip Jelacic, a fire-breathing imperial loyalist who takes matters into his own hands and invades what he regards as a renegade province. The Emperor still hopes for a peaceful resolution and sends a loyal general, Count Lamberg, to take command of Hungarian military forces. But on arrival, he's brutally murdered by a mob. Appalled, the imperial government declares war on the Hungarian revolutionaries. This in turn outrages liberals and radicals in Vienna. There is fresh violence on the streets, and the Austrian Minister of War is lynched Troops evacuate the city, while the Emperor flees to Olmutz. Jelacic marches to the government's aid. He joins forces with Windisch Greats outside Vienna, and together they bombard the city. Then they attack. The October Rising is crushed. I wonder here if the multi-ethnic nature of this empire is not in this case, in favour of the Habsburgs, in the sense that it prevents the troops to fraternise with the local population. With the loss of 2,000 lives, 25 revolutionary leaders are executed, including Robert Blum, a member of the German parliament in Frankfurt. He becomes a celebrated martyr of the revolutions. With Vienna secure, the Austrian invasion of Hungary can begin. 
the Hungarians are heavily outnumbered. Budapest falls, and the Hungarian government evacuates to Debrecen. Following the violence in Berlin that March, the King of Prussia withdraws to his palace at Potsdam, on the outskirts of the city. Here he is surrounded by loyal troops and conservative advisers, including a 33-year-old aristocrat named Otto von Bismarck. When asked for his view on what should be done, Bismarck says nothing, but leans over to a piano, and taps out the march of the Prussian infantry. So Otto von Bismarck was a genius. Where I think he particularly shines is that he knows when to use the carrot and when to use the stick. It is going to be especially active in the German unification. He knows when to draw the sabers and when to put it back. The forces of conservatism are strong in Prussia. There is deep loyalty to the state and the king. Allies, like Bismarck, adopt the enemy's tactics, launching conservative political organizations and newspapers to mobilize this support. By November, King Frederick William has noted the infighting of his opponents, and the defeat of the Vienna Revolution, and decides to act. He orders General Wrangel to lead 13,000 troops into Berlin. They enter the city unopposed, and order the Prussian assembly to disperse. It has no option but to comply. Prussia will get its constitution, but it is one handed down by the king, under which he retains full executive power. An absolute leader is born and bred in the idea that he has been appointed by God in order to fulfill the sacred task to represent him as a ruler. Even after the Franco-Prussian War, when offered to become German Emperor, the King of Prussia will reluctantly accept. So this uprising does not have the support of the army, for um, you have this whole uh, army with a state thing in Prussia, militarism is deeply encoded in the DNA of this kingdom, and it's the king's army. Uh, you don't have the king's support, he's not willing to reform, he has uh, junkers, the aristocrat landowners behind him, so yeah, the chances of success very, were very low to begin with. Prussian dreams of a true parliamentary system, even a republic, are dashed. In December, two new players take the stage, who will play key roles in shaping the fate of Europe's revolutions. In Vienna, Emperor Ferdinand abdicates in favour of his 18-year-old nephew, Franz Josef. He will reign until his death in 1916. Last Austrian Emperor. In Paris, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, nephew of Emperor Napoleon, is elected President of the French Republic in a landslide victory. Honestly, people don't know who he is. People don't understand its politics. A lot of people only vote because of the name Bonaparte. And the conservatives, monarchists that help him to secure the power viewed him as a fool, as a, a tool they could easily control in order to later bring back a more conservative system. But he's going to use them because he is very smart. He promises to heal divisions, impose order, and restore France to her former glory. In 
In Italy, the tumult continues into 1849. In the Papal States, the reforms of Pope Pius had seen him held up as an unlikely liberal role model. But escalating radicalism and violence, notably the assassination of his justice minister, Pellegrino Rossi, caused Pope Pius to flee Rome. In his absence, a Roman Republic is declared. It is led by Giuseppe Mazzini, the iconic figurehead of Italian nationalism, who's devoted his life to the unification of his homeland. But elsewhere, the Italian cause fares badly. Carlo Alberto resumes his war with Austria, with disastrous consequences. At the Battle of Novara, Radetzky inflicts another heavy defeat. Carlo Alberto abdicates in favour of his son, Vittorio Emanuele, to avoid a republican revolution. Twelve years later, he'll become the first king of a modern united Italy. In the south, Ferdinand reverts to absolutist rule and sends troops to Sicily who stamp out the revolution. Then, to the dismay of liberals across Europe, French President Louis Napoleon sends troops to crush the Republic of Rome and put the Pope back on his throne. He has decided the support of French Catholics is more important to him than the fate of Italian Republicans. He has to secure his power to reassure the Conservatives that he's going to stand for their old values. So yes, now we are a Republic, but no, we are not going back to the atheism of the French Revolution. Everything's under control this time. French forces are led by General Udino, son of the famous Marshal. Rome's defenders are led by Garibaldi. But despite skilled and courageous resistance, Rome is forced to surrender after a two-month siege. That summer, Radetzky also retakes Venice and puts an end to its republic. In March, the German National Parliament in Frankfurt had finally agreed on a constitution for a united Germany. It is to be a constitutional monarchy under an emperor. The man intended to play this role is Frederick William of Prussia. So when he declines the offer, the plan is killed stone dead. In public, he says it is impossible without the consent of the other German princes. In private, he says he would never accept a crown from the gutter, disgraced by the stink of revolution. He receives his crown from God, not from the people. Revolts in support of the national constitution break out in Saxony, the Palatinate and the Grand Duchy of Baden. They are crushed by local forces, assisted by Prussian troops. The Frankfurt parliament itself is dissolved. What hope there had been for a united Germany under a liberal constitution lies in ruins. In Austria, the new Emperor Franz Josef issues his own new constitution, reclaiming almost all political power. He also revokes all the liberal reforms passed by the Hungarian parliament, known as the April Laws. In response, Lajos Kossuth declares formal Hungarian independence, and the country begins an extraordinary campaign of military mobilization. Hungarian commander General Gergely retakes Budapest. He then launches a bloody assault on Buda Castle, overpowering its Austrian garrison. In desperation, the Austrian Emperor travels to Warsaw to formally request military aid from the Emperor of Russia. Here comes Big Daddy Russia, and they know one thing or two about crushing revolutions. And above all, they don't want the neighbour country to become a blueprint for a successful national uprising. Russian troops have already moved into Moldavia and then Wallachia to put down the Romanian liberal revolution. Nicholas now agrees to send troops to Hungary to crush those he describes as 
the enemies of order and tranquility. Hungary faces an impossible strategic situation, surrounded and outnumbered more than two to one. The combined onslaught is irresistible. The Hungarian forces are driven south and finally forced to surrender. In the aftermath, around 120 Hungarian politicians and army officers are executed. So ends Hungary's War of Independence. In 1848 was a year like no other, a series of seismic political events following one upon another like falling dominoes. But what had been achieved? A British historian famously described 1848 as the turning point at which modern history failed to turn. And for all the euphoria of Europe's springtime of the peoples, by 1849 it seemed that the counter-revolutionaries had won everywhere. But some gains did endure, such as the abolition of serfdom in Austria and the popular vote in France, though France became a little less democratic in 1852, after Louis Napoleon made himself emperor. Across Europe, governments modernised and paid more attention to economic and social issues partly in response to the new challenges that had emerged from socialist and working-class politics. The causes of German and Italian unification had been defeated, but made giant strides and learned crucial lessons. Their goals would not be achieved by ideas alone, but the realities of force. In the words of Bismarck, the great questions of the day were to be settled not through speeches and majority decisions, but by iron and blood. It would be wars waged by powerful monarchies that united Germany and Italy. The legacy of 1848, for good and ill, would be felt for decades to come. So I guess that's it. And I'm thinking about a movie called The Leopard. It's about the Risorgimento that takes place in Sicily. And one famous quote of this movie is, everything has to change for nothing to change. So that was very interesting. Don't hesitate to share your thoughts with me in the comments. And I wish you all a very nice day. Bye.